Welcome to Sweden in Transition, the podcast that meets change makers in Sweden. I am Sonia Lehmann and today I meet Thomas Sterner, a renowned environmental economist here in Sweden. He was involved in the IPCC as one of the authors in charge of the chapters on policy design. He has published hundreds of scientific articles and more than a dozen books on various topics such as energy, climate, transport, resource management and carbon pricing. Hi, Thomas. Welcome. Thank you. Do you want to complete this introduction? Well, I thought it was a very nice introduction. Most of my work, I try to focus on what I think is most important, which is how to design policies. I think of myself as a cooking teacher, so I can help ministers or governments or NGOs or companies for that matter in thinking about how to design policy. I start the podcast saying that the world needs urgent reinvention. Would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. It is really urgent. We are playing with a very big system, the whole world ecosystem, and important parameters like the temperature, the rainfall, other important vital signs of the planet. We might cause enormous damage. It's quite likely we will lose all the coral reefs in the world. In addition to the beauty... Of course, they also serve a very important role as feeding grounds for young fish, stabilize the coasts, they do all kinds of things. So they're very important. And there's numerous other systems that we may be losing, maybe the rainforests, maybe grasslands, maybe sea grasses, definitely the cryosphere, large parts of that is the ice. Already in Sweden today, the ski resorts that we have, the biggest cost for all these centers is actually making snow. This is crazy. This used to be the only thing that Sweden had for free was, was cold snow. And now we don't. And so they make snow and it, it actually requires a lot of energy. It's uh, stupid. Can you summarize the latest report of the IPCC? Just, you know, to people who don't really know so much about climate change, a climate change of 1.5 or 2 degrees, mm. what difference can it make? Mm. We are playing dice with something quite large and dangerous. And so it's hard to say exactly how urgent this is. What we could lose is enormous, and maybe we don't even fully understand their importance. We don't know where the tipping points are. We have to reduce our carbon emissions and so our consumption of oil, coal and gas to zero. The difference between one and a half and two degrees is a point in case. It sounds to many people like a, a very small difference because of our daily experience. Half a degree doesn't make much difference. But of course, the last ice age was only something like four degrees colder. And uh, there was a kilometer of ice here where we are sitting now. If you take the airplane to, to Stockholm and you look down, you can think maybe like a quarter of the distance between the plane and Earth was ice. There clearly wouldn't be any buildings. <laughs> There wouldn't be anything. There's an enormous difference that three or four degrees makes. Now we're going with three or four degrees in the other direction. And the exact difference between one and a half and two may in fact be enormous. And the IPCC tried to make an assessment of this and came to the conclusion that we could avoid costs of tens, hundreds of, of billions of dollars by avoiding the, the extra half a degree. At the moment, the best scientific guess is that it really would be uh, optimal to try to stop climate change immediately, which basically would mean about one and a half degrees of warming. Uh, if we do the, the fastest we can, that would be a big benefit to humanity and, and a benefit that is much bigger than the costs involved. It's unfortunately not the direction we are going in now. We are, we are on a path to three or four degrees. It, it's both important and urgent. If we wait 10, 20 years, we will have very big costs and suffering. And what is at stake beyond costs? Or how is assessed the cost? What is also the human cost of climate yeah. change? The whole concept of cost is complex, right? So cost of climate change, there is no credit card and there is no price tag. So we economists try, and conceptually it is clear, but complicated. <laughs> but you think of uh, climate change as happening, and then you think of the next 50 years. You think of if climate change had not happened, if this problem had not existed, you then try to, as best you can, calculate what would have been the path. 
not really for GDP, but preferably for welfare, that is for consumption and for many other things that we care about, including the environment, the health of children, and democracy, all, all kinds of things we care about in, in society. Then we compare the 100 years with and without. And it is the difference that is a cost. We usually refer to this as the damage function is actually something that I have published an article about about a year ago. There's been some high-level attention because Bill Nordhaus, who shared what is popularly called the Nobel Prize in Economics, it's actually called the Riksbanken Prize, in, yeah. he um, has also done this and has a, a different estimate. But in his Nobel speech, he actually used our estimate compared with his. In his calculations, having three or three and a half degrees uh, warming as being optimal. He got the Nobel Prize because he has thought of brilliant ways of defining costs uh, and how to think about this. But me and some other people think that he still underestimates those costs. Uh, in fact, using his methods, but with slightly different parameters, would be better. There's a debate in the, in the literature about how big the damages will be. In, in Nordhaus calculations, you get to a uh, temperature of three, even four degrees uh, warmer than today. Whereas I think we should try to make sure that we stay well below two degrees, like the Paris Agreement. I think the Paris Agreement has a suitable goal. The trouble is the Paris Agreement has no, there's no method. It's like a New Year's resolution. It's just a wish. So that is the problem with the Paris uh, Accord. Now we need to give the Paris Agreement much more teeth and much more detail to decide on, on how we get to this goal. And there, the most important thing to do is to put a price on carbon. It has to be expensive. So tell us about that. This is like we had a big uh, waste paper basket. It's overflowing because there's too much waste. That's because it's free. Everybody can put what they like in this waste dump, which is our atmosphere. If you start charging a price automatically people don't like wasting money, so they will think twice about putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Some people think that the purpose of the tax is to collect money, but that is not the case with an environmental tax. That is, of course, the general purpose of taxation, because we want to finance government. But in the case of uh, environmental tax specifically, the purpose is not really to collect money. The purpose is to change behavior. So... We have to go out and tell people we are taxing gasoline and the purpose is to change your behavior. So what's your reading of the crisis around the yellow vest in France? Well, I was very happy for a short time <laughs> when um, Hollande's government first who announced that they would uh, essentially follow the Swedish path of, of a high carbon tax. And uh, President Macron seemed to, in fact, speed up this process. I was actually invited to come to the uh, Ministry of the Environment twice uh, to speak Madame Royale and with uh, the Zulu and, and others. And uh, they asked my advice. I spoke about the Swedish experience. I said it's very important to do two things, to explain carefully why you are doing this. Then you have to make sure that you use the dividend for the sake of the climate. So it's a good idea to use this to speed up insulation of low-income housing, this kind of thing. You also need to think about the people affected. And if they are low-income people and they feel more affected, then you should use the money somehow to, to help those. So I think President Macron was, I think he set out with good intentions on this. But of course, he is a right-wing politician mainly. Um, I mean, he does kind of try to position himself in the center. He's been a minister in the, in the left-wing government as well. So it, it's a bit hard to say. But at the end of the day, he uh, abolished the wealth tax at the same time as he introduced the petrol tax. The popular perception in France is that he took the money from the uh, petrol taxes and used this to uh, lower the uh, wealth taxes. It, it isn't quite the way technically it works, but, but that was the impression given and was um, very bad timing, a serious mistake, something perhaps a brilliant politician should have understood and, and, and thought about before he did it. It was very serious consequences. The carbon tax is the best instrument. Sweden is so small that the countries like China and the United States, they hardly know we exist. So if a few more countries and a few bigger countries would have the same experience and uh, put in a carbon tax, and then the magic thing with the carbon tax is that it always works quite well. I mean, it takes a little time. 
that that's but after five or ten years you will find that the carbon emissions are much lower and the economy works fine and everybody is pleased, basically. But the first couple of years, there's opposition and people complain. <laughs> so it really would be very important to get a few more good experiences from more countries. And so I think it's, it's a mistake with very serious consequences, not only for Macron's government, in fact. Now, actually, a few other countries, Holland and Germany, are, are also introducing carbon taxes, but very slowly. They're all very scared after the French experience. In Sweden, what drove the acceptance of the tax? Well, it's a very special story. Each country, I think, has its own idiosyncrasies. First of all, Sweden has no oil, coal, or gas deposits. So we have no coal miners. We have no oil companies. There is no strong lobby of that kind. We did have the highest marginal taxes in the world, the most, in a way, socialist kind of economy. So we used to have 80-90% marginal taxes in the 1970s, and uh, this was nice for the uh, leftists, but created a lot of opposition. So the question in uh, 1990 that really galvanized a lot of people was a general reduction of taxes on labor. This was a big issue in Sweden directors of companies and uh, generally right-wing people, but even a lot of middle income and even workers, they w used to go out and say, leave us at least half our income was like the fighting. <laughs> so they wanted to cap taxes at 50%, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, of course, not very radical by uh, by U.S. Republican standards, but, but still. So this was the big issue of the day, the late 80s. Carbon tax in this context was a way of funding this. So the government said, we will lower the income tax yes. and we will finance that by a, a new yeah. carbon yes. tax. Going back to the French and people who have a hard time financing it, the ones who have a low income and are really dependent on car. I've actually written a book called uh, Fuel Taxes and the Poor. And um, because it's it's an argument that comes up quite often. There was a Swedish newspaper that had um, recently uh, written an article to illustrate that this was um, unfair to the countryside. I think the situation is a little bit similar in Sweden and in France. It's obvious that in the countryside they don't have a metro and they don't even have buses typically. So you have to go by car. However, the actual distance driven by people is not enormous in the countryside. There are a few people who need to go quite far by car, but there's also a lot of people in the countryside who don't go very far at all. They are old age retirees, farmers, children. So the difference that they found was of the order of magnitude 100, 200 euros between someone per year who lives in the countryside and in the town. As long as you explain and develop a mm. mechanism where you actually use the money to help people for whom it's going to really be a problem, then it's fine. Exactly. I mean, people in the countryside are upset and they have been upset for several decades because they are being left behind by economic development. I lived recently in France and I was, I always thought that at least in France, the villages are still alive and there are like many restaurants and shops and stuff. And I found that no, it's like in Sweden, in England, uh, the shops are closing, the petrol stations are closing, the so social services of various kinds are closing. Partly this is actually due to cheap gasoline. If we analyze this, the reason uh, why shops close in, in villages is because everybody has a car. The gas is cheap. They drive very far to these big shopping malls. <laughs> and the big shopping malls have stolen the, the business that they, you know. So it's, it's more complicated. But I think what, what we have to do anyway is take the feeling uh, seriously. And, and there are many things they want in the countryside. They don't just want cheap gasoline. They also want good medical services. They want schools. They want the school to stay in the village. They want internet and all these things. We can use tax revenues to provide other things. We can't subsidize the gasoline because we have to stop using gasoline. <laughs> so we can subsidize new forms of energy. In a decade or two, it will be an advantage. When all the transports are electric, It would be great to live in the countryside because you can have 
a lot of solar power and you can charge your own batteries. It will actually be easier to do that than to do it in the center of Paris because you can't have your own solar cells there. We have to find the advantages of living in the countryside as well to find new ways of supporting people so that we build a constituency because this is a false contradiction. Carbon emission is driven by a small amount of the population. The top couple of percent uh, consume about half GDP, so of course this applies roughly to energy as well, maybe in fact even more than proportionately sometimes, um, so, so yes. There are big inequalities between high salaries and low salaries, and I think in Sweden the gap is lower. I think it is, and my own amateur index is I look at the university since it's my workplace. The rector of a university, the highest paid person, gets six, seven times more paid than the people who do cleaning or something else who get the lowest wages. Of course, one could have an opinion about that difference already. In the United States, this is more like a hundred times. Basically, you have created separate societies. Sweden is becoming less and less equal since the last 20, 30 years, but still a lot less unequal. Full employment and social democracy and the role of the trade unions, a fairly equal level of schooling, very many factors behind this. If you reduce inequality by refraining excessive wealth at the top of the pyramid, then you will automatically reduce emission. We don't quite know what would happen if we change the income distribution. It could change many things. It could change the, the growth of the economy, the choice of technology. It's not that simple. It's not like you are taking a number of dollars and just spreading them out to everybody. But even if you did that, then of course... The new people who get those dollars would also consume. <laughs> so, so then there would still be emissions and resource use from that consumption as well. So it's all complicated, but it's still true that the richest 10% who account for most of the consumption and also environmental effect. I just think it's interesting because sometimes we oppose social and environmental priorities saying that uh, the urgency is to address economic and social questions and ecological questions are longer term and they are not as urgent, but actually they are the same question. Well, first of all, they're very related. And secondly, it may be a mistake to think that the environmental questions are long term. The term has come now and uh, fires in Australia, for instance, are quite a clear, uh, really large area. Maybe moving on to energy and to the Nordic countries, mm. always taken as a model for mm. sustainability because they took uh, probably good decision quite long in advance. Can you tell us if you think this uh, status of example is justified? Partly. I, I, I really think that the Swedish carbon tax is excellent. But there are many other good examples. Uh, Germany or, or even China uh, have been an example when it comes to renewable power. England was the first country that actually legislated a climate law. So Sweden had its uh, carbon tax. But there are many other things that I don't feel the same enthusiasm about. I mean, Sweden, like France, has big nuclear programs. And of course, a nuclear power is basically a good thing from a climate point of view, but I don't think it's a good policy still because it, it has its own sizable ecological risks. And uh, today is also a much more costly option. So if we want to be efficient about the ecological transition, we need to choose the cheapest options, which are today renewable. What is the energy mix in Sweden today? We have still a, quite a large nuclear part of our electricity, I mean, half our electricity. It's falling now, so a very large part of it is hydro. And we now have a more increasing part that is wind and, and some solar. We also have a lot of uh, biomass in Sweden. Biomass is quite controversial in technical uh, debate about the future, but I think that locally biomass is quite a good solution. Most of the world, you only have to wait about 12 hours for the sun to come back. So solar power is not only a good option, but a fantastic option. In this latitude, we don't see the sun for six months, basically. So it's a bigger challenge. Now, of course, we also have more hydropower and more biofuels. And I think with sustainable forestry, I think that locally is quite a good solution. Cities in Sweden, the heat is only from biomass? First of all, all the heat is district heating. 
And this is typically maybe three times more efficient than having your own boiler. So it, it's really a big difference. It's, it's a very good idea. And it's absolutely crazy that places like New York, the north of the United States, does not have district heating. Now, having said that, you still have to use some fuel. And uh, we do use a lot of, of wood, a lot of biofuel, but we also use waste incineration. Mainly, I think that's quite a good idea. But maybe we have done a little bit too much of it because we now actually import a lot of waste from all over the place. We also have heat pumps and, and lots of other technologies being used, a lot of industrial cogeneration. So industries that need steam, they typically use some fuel to produce their steam, and then the waste heat is, is fed into the district heating system. And of course, that's a practical thing to do. We also have much better insulated buildings. This is another sub subject I'm studying. The buildings in Sweden actually use the same amount of energy as the buildings like in France. And so... We have compensated the the difference in climate by a big difference in building standard. Of course, it's a great idea to have several glazings on the windows and uh, to have um, a lot of insulation and uh, it saves a lot of energy. It seems like Sweden anticipates quite a lot. What well, I think that? it is a consensus society. There's a, a process of um, discussion and proposals. Government doesn't just implement something that a minister just thinks of. It It is always preceded by a year or two of, of investigation, and these white papers are always discussed by everybody, trade unions and all the parties and the universities and so on. It's part because it is a cold society where there is no food in the winter. If you don't like plan for the winter, you die, basically. So I think there is quite a long understanding that it's a good idea to plan things and to agree about how to do, how to heat the cities and, and that kind of thing. It's funny you say that because one thing I've noticed that is maybe a weakness of Sweden, the food and the fact there is a, a very low food <laughs> sovereignty. What are the areas that you see that have been left off a little bit? If you would have come 50 years ago, you would have noticed that there was not much. You know, there was milk and there was eggs and there was potatoes and bread and that was it. No vegetables. So on the one hand, we have since 50 years, we've been a popular place for immigration. So we have a, a now a much uh, more diverse population. And this has brought a lot of new tastes. And we've also been economically very keen on liberal thinking. And so self-sufficiency was not a goal. We embrace trade. I think the ideology is that we are happy to sell ball bearings and cars to the whole world. And uh, then, of course, uh, you know, we, we think we're good at producing those things. And the counterpart of this is that we would buy pasta and uh, other stuff abroad. And uh, so for a long time, self-sufficiency has not been a goal and maybe we've been a little bit naive there is now a lot of thinking we almost abolished the army and the the military as well and now now there is a bit of rethinking and there is some thinking that perhaps we should worry about the self-sufficiency when it comes to food as well when i arrived in the summer 2018 just before i think it was in june everybody in sweden received this pamphlet in case of oh, crisis yeah. or war and i was really astonished by this because of the level of consciousness of risk there would be big costs even if we manage climate change in a really wise way. If we had sensible politicians anywhere between uh, Merkel and uh, Hollande and uh, Obama, just sensible <laughs> politicians who at least try to solve problems, then there will still be costs. It's, it's a very difficult problem and there will be costs. If we have conflictive politicians who like to start trade wars, maybe real wars too, then the costs can escalate to anything. We might get waves of refugees attempting to cross borders and the military attempts to stop them, conflicts about trade wars, and then countries that are not self-sufficient in food. And uh, So you can easily get a, a globalized catastrophe that is verges on the unimaginable. It, it can get very costly if we have bad policies on top of a big ecological problem. Won't that happen anyway? Because we already see refugees coming and attempt to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And, and actually, Sweden had a, a very brave and... For a while. 
for a while. Um, it's it's a very difficult problem to solve, but that doesn't mean it can't be solved. The ones we don't accept, we, I suppose, have to help perhaps where they are. These are terrible decisions. As I say, it would be a terrible challenge for even the best politicians. Currently, we seem we're not getting the best politicians being voted into power. There is a risk that the problems get really bad. People realize that there is limited resources. There might be not enough for everyone. Mm. And therefore, people want to protect their future, their territory. This again illustrates the problem of, of economic cost calculations. Suppose that uh, food is uh, 20% of the world GDP. Now, if we lose 10% of all the food in the world, you could, by simple multiplication, you could say, well, that's roughly 2% of global GDP. If we lose 95% of all the food, then that would sort of, with the same logic, that would be 19% of global GDP. But of course, that is nonsense. And the interesting thing is to understand why it's nonsense. And the thing is that if we lose a lot of the agriculture, of course, the price of food would rise so fast. Food will be the only thing that has a price, or maybe guns as well. And we will have a a nightmare with massive uh, killing to survive uh, with the little food that is left. So relative prices are very important to understand. Now food seems cheap, as uh, you know, genetically modified from um, farming uh, large areas of uh, Amazons with soybeans. But um, if this is not sustainable, which we often think it is not, then um, it is really this food has a wrong price in our calculations. And we make a big mistake when we close down Swedish farms and import all our food. Today, things are not sold at the right price because we don't integrate externalities to the price. In your mind, is it the same issue than carbon pricing? Well, it's very similar because it's a wrong price. <clears throat> the soybeans that, that comes from cutting down the Amazons and using agrochemicals and maybe pesticides and so on, is also creating a lot of um, bad externalities that we are not paying for. Nuclear power typically does not pay its own insurance costs, and that is a mistake. All activities should pay their insurance costs, so this is imposing an externality on, on society, so that should also be corrected. If we're going to survive uh, climate change, first we have to stop emissions in one generation, basically. Um, but at the same time, we also have to protect the ecosystems. If Australia burns as it is burning now, then we won't have ecosystems intact that can assimilate. We already have much too much carbon in the atmosphere. We need intact ecosystems to help us get back towards a normal state. It's very important. So what you're saying is that our economic model is relying so much on fossil fuels that a carbon tax will basically help the problem solved by itself. I can put this the other way around. You can make a list of all the things we have to do. We have to fly less off to the Maldives or, or Canary Islands or wherever people go on holiday. We have to start using our clothes more times instead of buying new skirts and shirts all the time. We have to start using more bicycles to eat less, particularly of red meat, to you know, make more metros, more district eating. You know. Instead of this long list, you could say, all you have to do is raise the price of the food. And most of these things will happen automatically because the bus company will say, oh, gee, look, there's quite a lot of people who are fed up about high gasoline price. Maybe we can start some new bus lines. And um, the car companies... Volvo, I've been consulting a little bit with Volvo recently. They are in a big hurry. They know that they have to go electric in five, ten years because of the prices of fossil fuels. Because in the US, the car companies are not thinking about this so much. I mean, they also know that eventually <laughs> it will happen to them as well, but they are still producing these big brands, suburban. And do you have the same reasoning for growth? Growth were the subject you couldn't uh, discuss before, but now I observe that there starts to be a consensus on the incompatibility of uh, eternal growth mm. in a limited planet. As an economist, what is your... Economic growth is the term we use for the average 
growth in all the sectors we have. It's not really the average growth that is important. It is the composition of output. So we really have to have good schooling, clean water, maternal care for you know the poor. And I think we could have enormous improvements in medical attention. I think there's a lot of things, other sectors, particularly when it comes to health, education, culture. Um, maybe communication is another quite obvious one does not really require an enormous amount of physical resources. What what is clear is that when it comes to gasoline, uh, aluminium, (laughs) plastics, uh, particularly the many of the nasty components of plastics, there we cannot have even growth. We can't even continue with the amount we have now. We need to phase out and phase down to zero. Many things that, that are toxic to the environment So I think it is much more important that we get rid of the activities that are destructive to the environment. I don't think we should artificially start by limiting total growth. We can find areas where we can have improvements for humanity that are have a relatively small impact on the environment. And we can allow, we should allow those. If we need human creativity to increase, uh, it's a good thing. From a paradigm of overconsumption to a paradigm of care and maybe culture. Yeah, well, it's clear with with me. It's a matter of choosing a quality and a healthy amount. So another way to put it is to move from quantity to an era of quality. Yeah. We had really high carbon taxes and taxes on uh, nitrogen and sulfur and a lot of other things and nuclear waste. And we could have a renewable economy based largely on solar and that could still give us a comfortable life. The scientific community has been repeating those messages for quite a long time now. Do you feel discouraged? <laughs> Or do you feel happy that now the message gets more attention and things are moving faster? I'm really very concerned. And it is deeply worrying that we have such a serious situation, first of all. I'm not happy that the scientists are proven right. I mean, it is. Uh, we have been suspecting that uh, the climate change is, is really a serious problem for a long time. It is now successively every year more and more certain, but this is a bad thing. <clears throat> the time we have left to solve the problem is shorter. Nobody seems to be listening. Politicians get elected who are uh, denying scientific fact, spreading lies and misinformation, and creating a polarization and conflict in society. So we have two crises, one crisis of nature and one crisis of politics on top. It's a serious situation. And still, where do you get your energy? The human psyche is complicated. Some people are depressed in spite of rather good preconditions. Some people are happy and, <laughs> and in spite of rather bad circumstances. I'm fortunate to have energy and to enjoy my work in spite of the fact that the subject is very serious. But the world situation has been serious in many ways for a long time. Ever since the Second World War, we have been under the threat of nuclear holocaust. And even before that, during the Second World War, we saw evil at a scale that is really hard to imagine. I mean, we have faced danger for a long time. We are lucky. Renewable energy works really well. It's not an unsolvable problem to produce uh, power with the solar power and wind power. So we should be able to solve this problem. So it's difficult, but it's not impossible. I don't think it's too late. Greta is a truly remarkable youngster who has exactly the courage and enthusiasm, uh, moral fortitude that is needed. Uh, we need politicians are failing. Uh, we need um, young people to, to react and protest. Thanks a million, <laughs> Thomas, for this great conversation we had together. <laughs> and hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot to you for listening to this episode. Please check the other interviews and subscribe if you want to make sure you don't miss anything. Hey, though!